Yeah, you know what it is. Sila Shalom back in the building. Our praises do the Creator. You know what I mean? Our praises to the Creator. Join another day, you dig? We outside. Rain, sleet, snow. We outside. Yeah. Invite whoever want to come in. How that work? Let me try something different. Man, let me go back. I don't want to mess up nothing. But yeah, though. You know, I hear Israelites talk about, like, doctrines. Like, you know, yo, what's up with this new doctrine I'm hearing about? This new doctrines that, you know, they trying to add on to the whatever. But really, doctrines has always been added to your Torah, the Bible, throughout the ages. You know, that's why I made the statement. The seven-day creation story is a Babylonian text. Or a Babylonian tale. So that was a new doctrine added to your law, statutes, and commandments. Because at one time, that seven-day creation story wasn't part of your Torah. At one time, your Torah was just law, statutes, and commandments. No stories at all. And then, things began to add to the Torah. They started adding stories to the Torah. This took place 450 BC when they compiled the Tanakh. That's when they added new doctrine to the Torah, becoming the Tanakh. So when you hear Israelites talking about new doctrine, understand that their Bible was composed of new doctrine. Once the laws was given to Moses, and then after that, y'all went into captivity and came out of captivity, 450 BC, I had the Tanakh. It wasn't the Torah no more, it was the Tanakh. Because things was added. New documents was added to the Torah. And it don't stop there. Because for every story added to the Torah is a new doctrine. So you got the story of the seven day creation story. The story of Adam and Eve. The story of the flood. The story of Cain and Abel. All those were added. So just keep in mind that the Torah has been adding new doctrine for a long time now. Yes, yes. We outside enjoying the day. You know what I mean? Now, another thing with the seven day creation story, we already exposed it as being Babylonian. But the next thing, the argument is how many days did it take to create? So one day, was it a thousand years? Was it one literal day? Some people say it was a million years. Although the Bible don't say a million years, but the Bible do say a thousand years. But let's take it a little further. It does not say, thus saith the Lord, when that quote of a thousand years is given. That quote of a thousand years was given during the first century, quote by Peter. It didn't come from thus saith the Lord. It was an expression from Peter when he said a day is like a thousand years unto the Lord. That was an expression. That was just a quote. That didn't come out the Lord's mouth. That came out of Peter's mouth. In order to validate if a day is a thousand years, it has to be thus saith the Lord, according to those who believe the Bible. So with that being said, there's nowhere in the Bible where God said a day is a thousand years. Coming back to the fact that the seven day creation story, if it was a thousand years, it would have said it. It would have said God created the first day in 1,000 years. It would have said it. 
but it don't say it. It say a day. It says yom. That's a day in Hebrew. And the word for a thousand is not present where day is expressed in the creation story. The first day, the second day. It doesn't say the first thousand years, the second thousand years. So we got to go by what the text say. We can't add or take away, right? So according to the text, in English and Hebrew, it both states a day. So there go your flaw, your creation story. Because in one breath, Peter is saying, in one breath, Peter is saying, it's a thousand years to a day. But in another breath, God is saying, I created the heavens and the earth in one day, not in 1,000 years. So whose authority is greater, Peter or God? Got to go with God, right? So if God is the authority, God said he created the earth in one day. And nowhere in the scriptures that God himself say one day is like a thousand years. That's a quote from Peter. Just to take things a little deeper than the surface. Critical analysis. Because some will say, you know, if it ain't thus saith the Lord, it ain't it ain't right and exact. So nowhere in the scriptures does it say thus saith the Lord is a thousand days. A day is a thousand years. You may quote it from Peter, you may quote it from David, but you ain't gonna hear it from thus saith the Lord. So that's what gotta be questioned. What the text says. So according to the text, in Hebrew and in English, it both says the earth and heavens was created in six, seven days, not 7,000 years. If you don't believe me, go to the, go to the, um, in the Hebrew, when it says in the first and the second day, or the first, the, the evening and the morning was the first day, go right there and see if any of those words say a thousand years. See, we got to be honest here. Can't get in our feelings. We can't add what's not there. I know you try to use precept upon precept, but the precept that's used for a thousand years is coming from Peter. And I think there's one in Psalms, but that's coming from David. But it has to come from thus saith the Lord in order to be authority. Because anybody can make a claim. See that? What it do, family? I see you, Ali. Yeah. Just going on here live real quick. So showing you those those are those are your two your two pointers to realize with the story of creation. First, that is Babylonian in origin. And second, a thousand years is not mentioned in the seven day creation, but a day is mentioned. So you gotta keep that in acknowledgement. When dealing with the text, when it says don't add or subtract, you know, a lot of Israelites are going to try to, you know, work their way around that argument. Oh, well, it's still a thousand years. No, brother. It don't say that in, in, in Genesis. It don't say a day is a thousand years. It don't say the second day was 2,000 years. It didn't say the third day was 3,000 years. So those were days, 24 hour days. See, this is why you got to explain. This is why you got to be on top of your game, because these false gods would hoodwink you, hoodwink you into believing something that it's not even written. You believing in the earth and the heavens being created in 7,000 years when it doesn't say that. It said he created the earth and heavens in six days and he rested on the seventh. It did not say 6,000 years in English or the Hebrew. And that's God's word. The other quote is from Peter. First century Peter talking about talking about a day is like a thousand years unto the Lord. Now if it says the Lord said a day is of a thousand years unto the a day is of a thousand years and a thousand years unto the day, thus saith the Lord. I wouldn't even be arguing this point. I wouldn't even be raising an argument if that was the case. But that's not the case. Because in the beginning he said, I created the heavens and the earth, separate the light from the darkness. The evening and morning was the first day. Now, evening and morning, you can calculate that. Evening and morning, 
12 hour sunlight, 12 hour night, give you a 24 hour period. You can't have evening in the morning without sunlight. So now there's your third mistake because now you're talking about even in the morning, which is determined and dictated by sun, by the sun, and the sun is not created until the fourth day. So you cannot even be using the terms evening and morning until after the sun is created, not before. So just showing you the inconsistencies of these false God stories. God has hoodwinked for thousands of years believing these inconsistency stories that don't even coincide with the, the real way creation is created. It doesn't even talk about the vortex in the creation story. The Babylonian nor the Hebrew. So you got hoodwinked in both departments. See, the Babylonian creation tale is the first account. Then after, after that, it was duplicated from the Hebrews and then from the Hebrews to the Greeks, from the Greeks to the Latin and to us in English. That's how it was trickled down. That's how the false God's doctrine was trickled down through the ages and how we have it today. And y'all still believe in that seven day creation story as if that's how creation of the heavens and earth was created by a man sitting in space subjected to his own heavens but in the same breath creating heavens separating light from darkness and evening and morning were the first day how can you have the first day without having the sun and another inconsistency is the third day because the third day is when fruits and vegetables were created now that's another inconsistency in nature you cannot have fruits and vegetables grown without sunlight it's impossible you can't grow fruits, especially tropical fruits, without sunlight. It's impossible. Try to go with watermelon or pineapples in the dark and see what happens. The seed ain't gonna bear. So how are you gonna have fruit trees growing and grass and herbs on the third day for a thousand years if y'all wanna believe that, or for 24 hours, which is according to the text. And then after that, the sun, moon, and stars are created a thousand years after that, or a day after that, on the fourth day. So not only do you not have light from the sun on the third day to feed the herbs, but you don't have sunlight or moonlight. You're just in total darkness with the herbs. See, that don't even make no sense. And then, on the fourth day, here comes the sun, moon, and stars. See how inconsistent the story is? But you'll press, you'll stay hard pressed the Bible believers will stay hard pressed to believe a story to try to make it make sense. When the Owasp is telling you the whole time that this is a false story created by a false God of his own imagination. So while you wasting time trying to explain the seven day creation story, trying to go in all detail in Hebrew, getting all deep with the words, uh, and all that, it's a fabrication, bro. You're wasting your time. It's like studying Pinocchio. It's like Pinocchio, say if Pinocchio was Old English, and you're trying to go to the Old English words of Pinocchio to decipher Pinocchio when the whole shit is a myth in the, in the, in the beginning. You're wasting your time, because once you after you decipher it, then what? You find out it was a myth, and it was a waste of time. Yeah. So that's how we expose in this Babylonian creation story that starts off your Bible. Satan got y'all, what they say, Satan is a massive deceiver. Satan got him locked from the beginning of the book. Chapter one, verse one, Satan got you hook, line, and sinker. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Barashit, bara, Elohim, waha, aretz. English or Hebrew is still both false. And Owaspi exposes it. That's why they run from the Owaspi because they don't want to face the exposure of these false gods and these stories and their intent, why they created these stories. Owaspi got all that in there. Same thing with every major false religion. The only thing that was authentic with Israel was when they got them law, statutes, and commandments, and when they got them oral laws, which were laws which were dealing with more of the higher laws. Those laws wasn't written down. When Israel started worshiping false gods, when they ran up in the land of Canaan, and they didn't defeat the Canaanites, and they started taking on customs of the Canaanites, I started worshiping the gods like Baal, El, Ashtaroth. That's when Israel fell. And I'll give you the time period. 
11th century BC, 10th century BC, 9th century BC, around the time when the kings began, the kings and the judges, when they started to reign, that's when Israel fell from the ways of the creator and started becoming pawns for the false gods like Baal and Ashtaroth, which were gods of Mesopotamia, which were gods of Canaan and Assyria. That's when Israel fell. 400 years after leaving Egypt. Those 400 years within, from leaving Egypt 15th century, 15th century BC to around 11th century BC is when Israel was dealing with the creator. You ain't hear too much from Israel. It was off the grid. But then after that, they started clamoring, wanting to be like the nations, wanting to have tribal gods, wanted to clamor and glory in the Lord thy God like the neighboring tribes. And they fell victim. The inspiration of the creator started becoming weak. And the inspiration of these false gods started gaining upon them through the, gating, through the guardian angels. And they used the women of the Canaanites to uh, seduce the men. Well, not even seduce them. They may have just been some badass shorties. You know what I mean? Some Kardashian type chicks. A nigga just got caught out there. You know what I mean? You know how dudes just, they try to you know be persuasive to women and cater to them. So they started bowing down some mutton to they holidays, they gods and stuff like that. Next thing you know, the false gods had a stronghold on Israel. Next thing you know, Israel worshiping deities. Instead of worshiping the creator, now they worshiping the man sitting on the throne in heaven, the sky daddy. And that's what you've been acknowledged ever since. It's been like 6,000 years since you really came back to the ways of the creator. We're even having a doctrine that tells you about the creator in a book like such as the Owaspi. All other books talk about the deity. The Bible talks about multiple deities. The Quran talks about Allah, the deity. We could touch on that too. Because some feel that, oh, Allah is the correct name and the correct deity, but most Quranic believers believe that Allah is the same God of the Bible. And there's verses in the Quran where Allah is referenced as Lord. So with that, that puts you right back with the deity status because Lord, God, and God are deity statuses. Those are not creator status. So Allah, the deity, in the Quran, the greatest mystery is who is Allah because Allah is a title. Just like Pharaoh was a title. The greatest mystery was who was the Pharaoh of Egypt. See that? Now that we know that it's almost the first. But who was Allah? That's the greatest mystery. We already exposed that Allah is Gabriel. But in the Quran, it got a Gabriel worded in as the angel of Allah. Yeah, when you write the text, you can flip it however you want. Because if you're the angel of Allah and you go into a prophet, you don't want to tell that prophet you Allah. He may not believe you. You got to come as a messenger of Allah while being Allah. See how that works? It gets deep. But see, you won't question these things if you just bow to the books. The creator gave you a mind to think. Think logic with rational and logic, reasoning. And here you have a book that challenges you to, challenge you to think. Think outside the norm. Challenge the text. Tony, what's good? I see you. I see you, Nina. What's good? Angel, what's good? Yeah, dropping these facts. Dropping these facts. That's why I keep pressing about these false gods, this creation story, because the majority of the world believe that this creation story is the way the world was created and how things were. In the beginning, when the whole time it was a false god narrating a story. Now, once you realize that the story was false, the next question will be asked, well, how, how was it in the beginning? That's a whole nother story because that has to be explained according to how worlds are created in habitable times. It's not a seven day creation story when you get the true story of creation. It's totally different from what you know. It's not one day. It's not in the beginning, 
God created the heavens and the earth with the real story of creation. With the real story of creation, everything starts with the vortex. The vortex is the first cause of creation. You cannot have no creation. You cannot have a planet. You cannot have a sun. You cannot have a moon. You cannot have a star without a vortex first. So with that being said, if the Bible was right and exact as the holy word of the creator, the vortex would have been expressed in that book as the first cause of creation, as explained in the Owaspi. The Owaspi says, I'm, I'm giving, I'm showing to man the manner of my created things. I use the whirlwind as a sign of my created, of the manner of my created things. And where do we see the whirlwind? Where's the reference of the whirlwind in nature? That's our reference, nature. So we see the whirlwind in tornadoes. We see the whirlwind in cyclones. We see the whirlwind in hurricanes and we see the whirlwind in galaxies above showing you the cause of creation and still showing you how it's demonstrated in nature of vortexian current. So the whole one day creation in the beginning, scratch that. Understand that the vortex is the first cause of creation. Now we can't put a time limit on the vortex. The time limit comes in when creation begins, physically manifestation. That's when you put the time limit. That's when time is in, in physical existence. And that time begins when the vortex precipitates minerals to the center of the vortex, creating warmth, heat, and then a globe of fire. Once that globe of fire is manifested, that's when the time begins for creation of this particular celestial body whether it be the sun, the moon, the star, or the planet. It all follow these rules. So that's just showing you like, when you're dealing with the Awasp, it gives you a whole different breakdown of how creation is created using nature and cosmology as a reference. See that? So you cannot even have light without the vortex. The vortex is what produced the light. So when God said, in the beginning, let there be light, that's vague. How was the light produced? So like I said, the steps to creation, and the Waspi explains those steps in four ages. Time of creation, time of inhabitation, time of desolation, time of dissolution. That's your creation story. It's like the four seasons. That's your creation story. It's a cycle. Now, in the Owaspi, it gives us a time period of this cycle. The time of creation is 144,000 years. That number sounds familiar, right? The time of inhabitation, which is the time we're in right now, where the earth is suitable for animal, man, and vegetation, that's another 144,000 years. That number sounds familiar, right? And then likewise with the third and the fourth age, there were 144,000 years, total making 576,000 years for a complete revolution or complete cycle and season of an inhabitable planet from its creation to its inhabitation to its dissolution and then to its dissipation, right? 576,000 years of 144,000 years spaced out in four groups or four ages. You see, Owaspi gives you that math to play with. So we're already dealing, you know, you know, the Bible got you believing in, you know, the earth being created in six days or 6,000 years. But here we're already starting off with 144,000 years in, in the first age. And then the, in the inhabitable age, another 144,000. So we're already dealing with great calibers and numbers greater than mortals can comprehend because we don't live that long. But the reason these revelations are given is because we live after death and these same revelations are going to exist because they apply in the spirit world as well. So the inhabitable age for mortals on a planet is 144,000 years. From its creation to its extinction is 144,000 years. That's how young we are on this planet. And according to the Oaspi, we're at the midway mark so we're at the 72,000 mark. That's half of 144,000 years, 72,000. So we're at the midway mark of the inhabitable age. 
we got another 72,000 years before the planet will stop producing, or more, I should better yet, I should say mortals will stop producing seed and so become extinct as to the planet. The same way certain animals become extinct. You know what I mean? Certain prehistoric animals become extinct because of planetary decline and, and, and because of planetary weather decline. Well, the same rule is going to continue to apply as the age progress. The planetary temperature is going to decline to a point where man will stop reproducing. His seed will become barren. No different than the tree that becomes barren in the fall and can't produce seed. It has to wait till that season comes back around to produce seed again. See, we live by those same rules as mortals. Owaspi break these things down. So when you're dealing with creation and the Owaspi, you might as well shake off the idea of that seven-day creation story. If you're still trying to have that thought while trying to understand the creation processes that the Owaspi gives, you're going to be confusing yourself because you're going to be holding on to that Babylonian tale. That false god is still going to have you bound in your mind believing that creation myth. So when you're studying the Waspi and them creation stories, I got a, a video called The Time Tables of Prophecy where I break the whole thing down on the sheet, breaking it all the way down. And then when you see that Time Tables of Prophecy laid out, you get a clear understanding like, okay, I see what's going on here. The Bible will never give you nothing like that. That's why the Yawaspi is a revelation that had to come. It came for you, Hebrews, because it came in the name of your creator, Yahweh. I am the I am. That's what the book came in. Don't get it confused. Don't let Jehovah fool you. That's just an English rendition because we speak English. No need to come in a language you don't speak. We speak English. The book came in the name of Jehovah. Jehovah is Yahweh in the Hebrew. Not no tribal God. Not no heathen God. Jehovah is not Baal and all that nonsense people try to tell you. That's foolishness. First Baal is Adonai. Yahweh in Hebrew don't mean Adonai. So we can't even play the word games by saying Jehovah is Baal and all that nonsense. Jehovah is the English expression of the Hebrew Yahweh. And originally the Hebrew Yahweh was the creator before they allowed the false gods, the Els and Elohims, to compromise their mind and make Yahweh into an angry and jealous God. Because most Hebrews believe that Yahweh is an angry and jealous God. He's a God of war. And that's due to the influence of the false gods. See, we got to shake that false gods doctrine off. But it's in your Bible, so you're going to believe it, hook, line, and sinker. It's going to take a lot for you to shake that off. You may never shake it off. It may take the very Lord God himself to let you know that, no, brother, I am not the creator. I'm your brother. I am what you are. I'm just a person in position. No different than a president. That's like the president coming down talking to you like, brother, I'm not your God. I'm the president. I'm just like you. I just was selected in office based off my resume. See how that worked? Based off my votes, they selected me in office. Who selected me? The people. The people of the kingdom selected the king. And you're, confu you're confusing the king as the creator. You're confusing God as the creator. When God is just a deity, a rightful ruler of the heaven and earth, that's only if you're dealing with true God. If you're dealing with these false gods, you got these self-proclaiming gods. Bow down and worship me, gods. So these are things you got to be mindful of. This is why it's hard for you to shake the Bible because it says, thus of the Lord in the Bible. Before you was Hebrew, you was Christian. And you held on to that Jesus belief. That old Jesus and old God and dancing in the church as a Baptist. And then when you turn Israelite, that 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 spirit was still there. All you did was just change, switch it up, and put a little Eastern culture on it, Eastern African culture. Hebrew Israelite, Hebrew Israelized it up a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was the same spirit. You just changed the name from Jesus to Yeshua, but you're still worshiping the deity. You still think you got to go through Yeshua to get to the Creator. That's what you believe. The Old Testament Israelites don't believe that. They don't even believe in Yeshua. They believe in just Yahweh. Now, if they were dealing with the Creator, they'll be right and exact. But the Yahweh they're dealing with is a deity once again in the image of man. Because if you ask an Old Testament Israelite, is Yahweh a God of war? Is Yahweh angry and jealous? They're going to say, yeah, you know why? Because it's in the book. So if Satan decides to put his words, 
If Satan was to put his characteristics and label it Lord God and put it in a book, how would you break free from that? How would you free yourself from the bounds of Satan when he disguised himself as Lord God in the book, being angry and jealous? In one breath, thou shalt not kill. But in another breath, if you got to kill, you got to be angry. If you're going to kill off a nation of people, or if, you get off, or if you're going to kill off some other human beings in the name of your God. The early Christians did it. The Christians, the Catholics, they killed massacres during, um, during the, um, the early crusade days. Like the first, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth century, right after, like right before Constantine, even the first century coming up, even during the time of the Messiah, I mean, it was war and them false gods was at war. Look how they was crucifying cats. Crucifying cats upside down. That was Roman, it was capital punishment. See that? The God of Rome was crucifying cats upside down, bro. Where's that in the scriptures? But the Romans, whatever God inspired them, inspired them to, we're going to crucify you upside down. Or we're going to crucify you like this. The scriptures say a man break the rules, he gets stoned to death. You know what I mean? And it talks about hanging on a tree too. You see what I'm saying? So it gets deep when you're dealing with these gods and their influences over thousands of years. What it do? Sharon, what's, what's good? Yah, what's good? I see you. What's good, family? Yeah. Touching on this, touching on this knowledge, man. Quick fast, just want to drop some gems to y'all while I'm out here walking these mutts. Walking these, these 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 man eaters. Well, I shouldn't even call them mutts. They're not even mutts. They purebred. I'm bugging. Purebred Maltese. Yeah. See my man Tony. Yeah, it's a trick. The trick is to keep you trapped. Exactly. It's like with the flat earth. It's a trap. It's no escape. In one breath, the flat earth to say you in a dome. A dome? What is a dome made of? What the material is made of? And what is the extent of the dome? Because they got the circumference and the earth measured out. So if the circumference of the earth is measured out and there's a dome over it, that means we could be able to reach the circumference of the dome and pound on it and be like, yo, do, 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 do. It's the dome. This is where it starts to arch and curve. But the truth of the matter is that there's some relevance to the dome aspect because we're not in a dome. We're in a vortex. And the vortex do act as a dome. It keeps us within within the, uh, the vortex. See, the vortex is the atmosphere and we're in the center of this vortex. And there is no escape in this vortex unless you are an Ethereum angel coming at the harvest time to crack open the arches of them vortex and, and, and enter in. If you ain't no Ethereum, you ain't, you ain't doing it. That's why we ain't leaving the, the vortex, I should say. That's why we got to send material out there and stuff like that. And that's the science to that. Because if you're trying to send a satellite to Mars, or even the moon, let's say the moon. If you're trying to send a satellite to the moon, we got to know the velocity of the vortex of the moon and the velocity of our vortex. And they got to catch where they meet in order for the satellite to be drawn into the moon's vortex in order to settle. See that? It's a science. These scientists know what's going on. They know about vortex here. Yeah? Even when you look at a rocket or, or a space shuttle, when it leaves off the ground, it doesn't go straight forward. It goes in a spiral. It starts to begin to ride the vortex. As soon as it reaches far enough to where it, it's in contact with the moon vortex, it gets engulfed in the moon vortex and it's drawn in, drawn to the center. And they land on the goddamn on moon based off the principal rule of the vortex. That's why I said you can't escape the vortex. You can't explain nothing in creation without dealing with the vortex. If you want to go from here to another planet, you got to ride the vortex. You're not just going to straight, go straight, straight to space and just in a straight line to the moon or a straight line to Mars. No. 
you can start off straight, but then before you know it, you're going to realize you've been, you're, you're curving. You start off straight, but then when the further you look back, you're going to start seeing curvature. The same way we look at the moon and we see it's a, it's a ball, but if we was on the moon, we'll think the moon flat too, for those who believe the flat earth or the whole flat premise, because you subjected to the, you subjected to the, the, um, the planet. You can't dictate the size. You, you, you can't dictate the shape of the planet being subjected to the planet. That has to be done objectively. So the only objective reality we have to see with the whole is the sun and the moon. And they both are global in appearance. Both the sun and the moon. And they're both different densities. One is a solid, one is a gas, and they still form a globe. They don't form a flat disk. And that's objectively viewing, being subjected on Earth. So if Jehovah the Creator is showing us two balls in the sky as an example, why would he have a different rule for our planet? Our planet would follow the same rules. If we were standing on the moon looking back at the Earth, we're going to see a ball. Because we're going to be viewing the planet objectively as a whole. Being that we cannot view our planet objectively as a whole, the only examples we got is the sun and the moon. And they both are global due to the vortex. That's why if you put water in zero gravity, it forms a globe and it can suspend an air. If you see, if you see the scientific, scientific methods or the scientific experiments with water in zero gravity, because for the flat earthers, they say there's no gravity. So let's go with that. There's no gravity. So water in zero gravity forms a globe. It doesn't form a flat disk. And the earth is 75% water. So the dominant shape of the earth is going to be dictated through water being a globe with no gravity. Owaspi well, explains that too, that earth and you know, the worlds are global in shape. Now, I'm not denying that planets may be flat. What I'm just saying is that there's no valid proof in creation of that. And the only scientific method we have is to put liquid in, in, a, in a zero environment and see what the shape turns out to be. And it turns out to be a globe. You put some debris on that water and it starts to circulate. You got a planet. They got experiments. Put zero gravity on YouTube and water. Water and zero gravity on YouTube and see what happens. See what shape the water turns. See if it's a flat disk or a globe. The same rules apply with fire. Put in fire in zero gravity and see what pop up. See what shape you get. You don't get a circle. See that? So even using their own logic, worlds are globally due to the vortex. Faithism was good. See you, family. Yeah, just dropping some gems on creation, dropping gems on these false gods, assuming to be the creator. Because a lot of people will say Jehovah is Zeus. Jehovah is Baal. They'll tell you Jehovah is all these names, but they won't show you in history how the evolution of that happened. They'll just go to some definitions and say, look, see, Jehovah, uh, tribal god, Baal. Where? Show, show me that in the Bible where Jehovah is a tribal god. Show me in the Bible where Jehovah throwing it is lightning and bolts and angry and jealous. So show me where Jehovah's saying that. I can show you where the Lord, thy God, is saying that in the Bible. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 1 in comparison to Genesis chapter 2 with the phrases God and the phrases Lord God. Because in Genesis chapter 1, the phrase God is used. But in Genesis chapter 2, You hear the term Lord God. So how do we go from how do we go from God to Lord God? That's like saying in Genesis chapter one is speaking of president, and then Genesis chapter two is speaking of vice president. We know for a fact that the president and the vice president are two different people. So if we're dealing with one creator, who are these deities? All right, so back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 is Elohim. 
in Hebrew. We're dealing with the Hebrew, right? Elohim. That's more than one God. So that whole chapter dealing with the creation story from the creation, from the first day of creation to the, to the resting on the Sabbath, those are a group of deities doing that. And the revelation of that is in let us make men. That's when they leaked out the error. Instead of saying, let I make man in the image of I, instead it said, let us make man in our image. So that's where your false God screwed up. He forgot to leave out his scribes in that department and, and, and leave himself as the center deity. But he added his deities in the text. He added his scribes, his writers in the, in the creation myth. So that's your first strike. You're not dealing with monotheism. You're not dealing with one God. You're dealing with multiple gods. And then when we come to chapter two, it even gets worse. Because chapter two says the Lord God. Now, you would think that's singular, right? When you look at that in the Hebrew, Lord God first is going to say Yahweh God. That's another error. But let's deal with the term God in that instance. That's Elohim again. It's not even L. So it's Lord God's in the Hebrew. As far as when you translate the word God, dealing with Lord God. Now, they got Lord as Yahweh in chapter 2. That's incorrect. First off, Lord doesn't mean Yahweh. And Yahweh doesn't mean Lord. In Hebrew, Lord is Adonai. In Hebrew, uh, Yahweh or Jehovah is Yahweh. Yahweh means self-existent. Lord means, Aduna means Lord. Two different definitions, two different meanings. So when you look at the second chapter of Genesis in English, when it says Lord God, correctly in Hebrew, it's supposed to say Aduna Elohim. But instead, it says Yahweh Elohim. See how they attached the creator's name to the deities? They brought the creator down to a deity. They deified the creator, put him in the lower ranking gods. That's how your Jehovah became these Zeus and these Baals and these tribal gods. Because these false gods took on the names as well of the creator, making them into an image of a man. So now you have Yahweh who's supposed to be the creator, now he's an Elohim. He's not even one person, now he's a group of people. You got some trying to break him down as the Trinity. Oh, he's the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Total confusion, totally lost. The false God has done total damage to the mind of the Christians or anybody who believe in the Bible or reads the Bible and hold that to be the Holy Word of God. They have done great damage. So now, Lord God, I do not L. Yahweh El, Elohim, is walking through the garden. So now they made the mistake. Is in Hebrew, it doesn't say El, it says Elohim. When you look at Genesis chapter 2, Bereshit chapter 2, and when the first, the first verse where it says the Lord God, translate that into Hebrew and see what you get. Translate the word Lord from that verse in Strong's Concordance. The real term Lord is going to be Adonai, but they, they erroneously put Yahweh or Yahweh and then define the word God right next to it in the Hebrew in Genesis chapter 2. I guarantee you it's going to say Elohim. It ain't going to say El. It's going to say Elohim in the strongest concordance and then it's going to use, because Elohim is the child root. You're going to, it's going to lead you back to the parent root and the parent root is El from Elohim in the strongest concordance. See that? I Ben did this homework, man. Ben did that homework breaking down the strong concordance and really understanding what the words mean. And I don't even accept that. But I did the knowledge and did the homework. It's all about getting the knowledge. And even if you don't believe it, still get the knowledge. And that's where you reign supreme when you know, even if you don't believe it. So Lord God, right? Now you have Elohim in the, in the beginning. Now you got Lord God. Yahweh Elohims. Yahweh Elohims. That's what it's saying in Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God. Yahweh Elohims, or you could say, I do not Elohim. Correctly, 
In Hebrew, it's Adonai Elohim. But they put Lord and changed Lord to Yahweh. I don't know where they got that from. That's where in Jeremiah 8, 8, when it says the false pens of the false scribes, that's where, that's where you got to consider these verses at in the text. When it talks about, when you see those inconsistencies like Lord being referenced to Yahweh and Yahweh being referenced to Lord. When Lord can be referenced to any any deity because that's just a title. Just like Pharaoh is a title. Just like King is a title. Anybody can be referenced with those titles. Anybody could be Lord. Anybody could be God because those are titles bestowed on who? Deities. See that? This is why your boy dangerous. This is why they want to step into the ring with Sila Shalom, dealing with the gods. Y'all can have the nations. Y'all can have all the tribe of Israel, uh, the Hamites, the Canaanites. Y'all can have that. I don't give a damn about the nations. Give me the gods. Give me the ones who put you in the thought process of believing that you are greater than the nations. That the nations got to be decimated by three-fourths of the land. You sound just like the, the Illuminati who said that the world got to be cut back to 500 million. Your God sound just like that God. Hmm. Similar. Yeah, it gets real out here. Yeah. Tell them Hebrews that. Go to your Hebrews. All these camp leaders, talk to them about these things. Some of y'all are part of these camps. I see y'all names and titles. Go to your camp leaders and question them about these things. And tell them to prove it with chapter and verse. Tell them to prove that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, or is it Adonai El? Ask them that. Is it Adonai Elohim or is it Yahweh Elohim? Genesis chapter 2, when the first word or the first encounter of the word Lord God is expressed, when Lord God is dealing with Adam in the garden. Ask your, ask your rabbi that. Is the Lord God Adonai Elohim or is it Yahweh Elohim? Because the definition of Lord is Adonai. But then when you look at the definition of Lord in that verse in Hebrew, they're going to say Yahweh, erroneously speaking. See that? Ben did the homework, man. Ben did the homework to this stuff. That's what I'm telling you. I ain't wasting no time playing games. I done read all the books. Y'all now, some of these cats now starting to be Israelites, now getting into the Bible. I, mean, I used to study Hebrew, read Hebrew, learn Hebrew at one point. Yeah, knew it. Studied it. But it wasn't the truth. It's just speaking another language. It's like learning Spanish. You ain't gonna get no closer to the creator from learning Spanish. And then you learn in a dialect that don't nobody really speak. Ain't nobody out here speaking Hebrew. And then when you go to the land of Israel, they're not speaking the Hebrew that you consider the Paleo ancient Hebrew. They speak in the Yiddish and the modern Hebrew. So it's either if you're gonna go live in the land of Israel, you gotta adapt to that custom of Hebrew. But you fight that down, so you're wasting the time dealing with language arguing language when language holds no weight because the same language was spoken who killed the prophets the, the 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 prophets of israel the killers of the prophets spoke the same language of the prophets see that those who persecuted the the, the pharisees and the scribes that persecuted john the baptist that persecuted yeshua spoke the same language so the truth ain't in the language truth ain't in the language. You can learn it as an extracurricular activity. You know what I mean? Something to do. But who you gonna speak that with? Same thing with the ancient Egyptian cats when they're trying to learn metal and the same for the hieroglyphs. It's a waste of time. You wasting your time because you ain't gonna have nobody to really express the language and speak fluently in that. And then the glyphs are too voluminous to really comprehend. It's gonna take from the time of Napoleon with the Rosetta Stone till now y'all still ain't deciphered the glyphs y'all still only deciphered a small percentage of the glyphs and what we did decipher which gave us the Egyptian book of the dead or the book of coming forth by day coming forth by night when you read that it ain't nothing but a whole bunch of spells a whole bunch of worship to Osiris you notice though none of the Egyptian cats read from the book of the dead with all that comedic talk they talk you never see them actually go in chapter and verse like how Christians, Muslims, and Israelites deal with their Bible and the Quran as their forefront book. You don't never see the comedic cast dealing with that Egyptian book of the dead. Because 
once you tap in and read some of that shit, you realize like, damn, okay, I can't come to the people with this, especially in this day and age. First, the shit is, you know, fragmented, and it doesn't give you a complete understanding of what the hell going on. So this is why OWASP is so dope, because it's not coming with no ancient manuscripts you got to try to learn. It's coming to you in plain English for you to understand what's going on, plain and simple in this day and age, in reference to the past as well. So we ain't got to try to learn English to learn Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Or, you know, in the English, you know, you got to read it in the Hebrew. It's the same goddamn thing, bro. Don't let them fool you with that. You know, some words may be modified and changed, but it's the same false story. Killer G, what's do? I see you. Yeah. But that's real, though. This is why they run. And not just me being sarcastic when I say this is why they run from the Owaspi. It's because once they start reading this information, it's going to start challenging their belief. It's going to start giving them more information than what they, what they already have. So now that if you thought Yahweh was God and you find out that he's not God, but the creator, that's only putting you in a better position. You're not losing by that. But you want to keep it tribal. You want to keep it gangster. You want to keep going with your false god. And that's cool. You're going to come back to the ways of the creator eventually. You may just have to learn the hard way. It's like some cats you tell them not to go this way in life. And they go the hard way to get locked up through 10, 15 years before they actually learn that they shouldn't have did that. Same thing with this. You're going to realize you spent X amount of years believing that this God was the creator and he wasn't. And we were trying to tell you the whole time. That's how they, that's how the converters come with that mentality. You know what? When I started reading the Oscar, you was right. You know, I got some great pointers about as far as the difference between the ranking angels being titles of Lord God and Lord and stuff like that compared to the creator. Yeah, I see it now. See that? I hear that all the time. And that's what you want to hear. Because now you're freeing the souls of those and you know that was once bound to the false gods. A waspy is a guide. Just like anything else in life. If you wanted to go to another state, you're going to have to use a map to get there. Or if not, you're just going to be going in a direction you not know which way you're going. So you need a guide. You're always going to need a guide in life to assist you until you know the way of the road. And then you don't need the guide until you explore more ground. And you're going to need a guide for those unknown realms. See how that works? And you continue to be guided, independent, guided, independent. And that's the journey. That's the journey. So ask your pastors, ask your rabbis, ask your Hebrew Israelite priests, them, about Genesis chapter 1, Elohim, in comparison to Genesis chapter 2, Yahweh Elohim or Adonai Elohim. How the false gods bamboozled you to believe that that's the creator, using the creator's name. How deplorable is that? <laughs> so like I said, man, I'm here to free the minds and the people. The deal, what it do? I see you. Chiming in. You know what I mean? Just chiming in for a few, just dropping some gems. Can't walk with my dogs. But like I said, you know what I mean? Ask your people. Question them books, yo. Don't think when I first got the Owaspi, I just believed it. I challenged it the same way I challenge any other text I get. Even with the Bible, I had these questions about the inconsistencies of the Bible before the Owaspi. I just ain't had the answers of why until the Owaspi. But I always had the questions of why God say, let us make man. Or, how is that in there? That's And how many articles, blogs on that chapter alone about who is this us and let us make man? That was the greatest mystery until now. Redeciphered it. 
in the Awaspi it explains who was this us, and in the original records of where it came from as far as where the Hebrews got the story from. Being the Babylonians, it reveals who the deities was. Murdoch being the God that made man. The God that made man on the sixth day in the Babylonian text was Murdoch. Under the voice of Ea. E-A. See, the original text in the Babylonian scriptures, it gives you the deities. It gives you Anu. It gives you Enlil. It gives you Enki. It gives you Ninkarsag. It gives you Murdoch. It gives you Tiamat. It gives you these things. And then it gives you Adamu, the man. Made by... Who was he made by? Enki or Lil? One of the two. See, that's what Malagazi York brought in the 90s, but Cass wasn't ready for it. Malagazi York was able to get his hands on um, the works of Zara... Zara, Zara, Zara what's his name? Stitchens? Yeah, the, the dude who... who who translated the uh, Sumerian text, Zachariah Stitchens. That's who Malachi Ziyok got the knowledge from and put the twist on it and gave it to the people as the Nubian nation. But he got it from them dudes, man. He got it at a time where it wasn't popular or easy accessible. So when you was able to obtain knowledge that the masses didn't have, you could now look like the great one with the wise knowledge because you got knowledge that nobody else got. So mid 90s, early 90s, late 80s, late 80s, 90s, late 90s, Malik York was the man because he was sitting on information that the average person had. No different than antiquity. Not everybody re read the Bible in antiquity. You couldn't have the Bible in antiquity in them early um, Roman days, fourth, fifth, sixth century Roman days. It was only with the church. You couldn't even read the, the average person couldn't read the Bible. So that made the person who had the knowledge of the Bible look bigger than what they were. So Malachi was bigger than what he was because he had this information. Then he put his, he put the information in books, rewrote it and put in his own little twist in the books and gave it to the people, writing hundreds of books based off these Sumerian texts. And then that's how we got it. That's what they call Malachi of York, the master teacher. Because he had this knowledge at a time nobody else did, and he was able to captivate the minds. No different with the Owaspi now. How we but see, we ain't keeping the Owaspi hidden. We trying to get you to read it. We offering you a challenge to dispute it. So we ain't hiding or we ain't keeping a secret. The Owaspi exposes us all. The creator exposed all. There is no secrets with the creator. There is no agendas and covenants, secret covenants with the creator. Everything in nature is recorded as it happens, and that's what he left. That's what the records show, as it happened. You think some of these false gods are happy to see their records being exposed like this to let us know what happened in the lower heavens and earth in antiquity so we can better prepare ourselves so these things won't happen again? Although a lot of those false gods are now become one with the creator. They, they, they turn from being false and return to the true ways of the creator. But that mark is still left behind of their works. No different than a gangbang who done blood, who, who, done, who done dirt in the streets but changed his life. But that don't change the fact of his works that he did. See that? That's why it's important gain knowledge and understanding so you can better prepare yourself physically and spiritually because if you don't prepare if you don't get this right now and you cross over in spirit they got you hook line and sinker the angels of the false god go come deliver you they're gonna say yo you want to see god you got to serve 200 years of servitude you got to crawl on your belly you got to do this you got to do that and then can you see then can you peek and get a look at God from the arena, like being in the stadium? You at the you in a stadium and you at the top of the stadium, and you can barely see the center or what's going on on the field. That's how you're gonna be in your heavenly kingdom, in the throne of your false god, looking from a distance just to get a glimpse of your false god after 200 years of servitude. See that? Oh, I speak expose all that. It expose all that for you to avoid being in them conditions. 
I just imagine you did 200 years of servitude just to get a glimpse of your God from the top of the stadium. And in order for you to get closer, you got to serve another 400 years of servitude. And then you would get midway within the throne or within the uh, arena. And by the time you reach a thousand years and realize you've been deceived and look back that you've been doing all that, you've been played for the sucker for a thousand years, what's going to be your response then? Exactly. You're going to want payback. You want to get back. Now, just imagine that on the minds of millions and millions of people you done deceived in your heavenly kingdom. Got them believing that you're the creator, not knowing you're just another jack like one of them. Now they found out. Now you hiding from them. They calling you out. Where you at? You got to explain these things to us. You told us you was the creator. You lied to us. Come and defend yourself. You in the temple, hiding, scared to death, you and your councilman, because the gig is up. See, I'm just dropping this knowledge so you could avoid being in those these predicaments. I serve the creator. I'm not worried about being subjected to these false gods. My guardian angel is strong and faith with the creator over here. No influence of these false gods could come over here. They had their chance. They failed utterly. Faith, even though Waspi mentions a flood happened that destroyed some of the work behind the text production and development. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When the Waspi was transmitted, when they realized what they got, yeah, them drudges got the work. Them spurs of darkness got the working to try to counter counter the text. Because even though the Waspi talks about how, you know, the works was given into men and righteous works, then it fell into the hands of drudges. And we see that through some of the, uh, through the conspiracies with the Owaspi. Your boy Wood Payne bring it out all the time. He talk about how, you know, the occult followers of the Owaspi. See, we ain't moving like that, man. Those were some old 60 hippie cats. You know what I mean? Got the text. Still in the world. And they tried to do whatever. I ain't got nothing to do with that. The starvation of the occult and all that. That's on they watch. So it's like to use that to discredit a waspy, it's not going to hold no weight. Because once the information in the waspy comes out against stuff like that, then you're going to realize like you're a judge according to your own account. So you can't use a book as an excuse for the actions of a people. You could only blame the person for doing what they did according to whatever reason that they did it for. How many people hold up the Bible and go on a crusade to kill? Same thing with the Muslims, with the Quran, in the name of their God. They go on crusades to kill. But you can't blame the book. You got to blame the action. Even if the book is telling you to do that and you go do it, you still got to blame yourself. Because if you're foolish enough to go kill off man, woman, and child because the book says so, then when you do get locked up and they ask you, why did you do it? And you say, the Bible told me to do it. They're not going to lock up the Bible. They're going to lock your ass up. They're going to put that Bible right back on the table and be like, nigga, that's some bullshit. And look at you and be like, why did you kill these people? And what you say, well, you know, in, in the scriptures, you know, I'm trying to you know, follow the law. And as an Israelite, the Lord said in, in, in Leviticus or in Deuteronomy that we were supposed to kill off Emelech. And we found out that today Emelech was the, uh, the Esau, the European. So we decided to, to take initiative. You know how foolish you're going to sound in a courtroom talking like that? So you can't blame the book. And no one in a book, a waspy condones anything dealing malice to children, to animals. It's just, it shows you in the book that thou shalt not kill this living creatures. So if you go against that, you're not following the scriptures. You're going off your own intent. And the waspy talks about that. That's how false gods become false gods. Because they start off righteous, then they go off on their own intent before coming back to the to, to, to the fold. You see that? So even for those who try to use those conspiracy cults using the waspy as a as a reference, that don't hold no weight. It ain't gonna hold no weight over there. You can raise the argument and I'll let you get the flow like I told Wood Pain, for those who know Wood Pain. I told him when I start my YouTube, I'm gonna let you have the floor. Get it all out. That don't bother me one bit. Because each man is held accountable for his own actions. 
Even John Newbro, who brought the revelation. Ain't no scapegoats. You could be righteous and then you could fall. You know what I mean? Look at look, look at some of the stories of the of the of the gods in the lower heavens. Look at the story of Ahura. Ahura the false, Sea Tusk, who styled himself Ahura. Look how he rose and fell. Anu Hasaj, Osiris, Baal, Ashtar off, all of them. All of them was part of the creator. All of them was part of true God's heavenly kingdom. Anu Hasaj, Osiris, the false. Chilimung, real name, according to the text. Baal, Ashtar off, all of them was part of true God's heavenly kingdom before they was influenced by Anu Hasaj to break away and start a new heavenly kingdom installing Enu Hasaj as their Lord God and creator in the image of man. That's when the deception started 6,000 years ago. That's when your Anunnaki's came out on the scene, your Sumerian creation stories, your Babylonian creation stories, your Egyptian creation stories. Those were the false gods creation stories of the 23rd arc cycle prior to the Israelites getting it. So the Israelites wasn't, had no part wasn't even around when these false stories first came about. When Israel came out of Egypt going into Babylon, I mean going into, um, into Canaan, they didn't, like I said, Moses didn't come off the rooftop screaming in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that was the case, it'll be in the story of Moses' life. Although it says in the beginning, Genesis 1, it'll be in the story of Moses' life. It'll be a point where Moses would have came down and said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He would have stated that. But what did he come down the mountain and say to Israel? Hey, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Love thy neighbor as thyself. He came with that. He didn't come with goddamn Adam and Eve and they sitting around a campfire listening to Adam and Eve and the serpent. No, Moses ain't come with that. How you gonna come out of Egypt dealing with their false creation story? Dealing with the comedic creation story, new, gab, nut, and all that, to come be told another creation story of a seven day creation myth coming out of Egypt and then coming out scurrying, starving, hungry. You ain't trying to hear no creation story. Moses ain't come down with a creation story for the Israelites. He came down with law, statutes, and commandments so they could begin to live according to the law. That's what Moses did. He came with the law. And then, for 400 years, they was living and upholding the Mosaic law. And then around the 10th century, 11th century BC, that's when the false gods, Baal, Ashtaroth, gained inspiration over the Israelites. When the Israelites failed to utterly kill off the Canaanites, that was inspired by a false god to utterly kill off the Canaanites. And when they failed to kill off the Canaanites, the Canaanites, Baal, gained influence over them. So you have Canaan, I mean, you have Baal, El, Dagon, Ashtaroth. You had multiple gods within the land of Canaan, Shemesh, Holy Sumerian deities still in the land, still being deified and worshipped by the natives of the land prior to Israel coming into the land. See that? Abraham was a stranger coming into the land of Canaan, which was already established. Paleo-Hebrew, Paleophonation, Hebrew, that's Canaanite language. Abraham came into the land speaking Canaaniform, because that's what he was, that's the language of his country. When he went into Canaan, that's when he first heard the Paleo Hebrew, because that's what the language of the Canaanites who was living there speaking. Bang. So when the patriots came about, when, when, when Isaac was born into the land in Syria, and then when Jacob came about, and when the 12 tribes, what language do you think they were speaking? They were speaking the native language of the land, which was the Canaanite Paleo Phoenician. Later, y'all took it as the Hebrew, thinking it's Hebrew. It's Canaanite in origin. And then, when y'all began to multiply, Joseph went into Egypt. Then the family went into Egypt, stayed there for 400 years. And now you're coming back out of Egypt, coming back into the land of Canaan. So you spent 400 years studying, learning, living like Egyptians, speaking the language. So you leave Egypt at the ending of the 12th dynasty, at the end of the Middle Kingdom, 
give you a time period, speaking the language of the Middle Kingdom, leaving Egypt, coming into the land of Canaan as Egyptians, because that's what you are still. And then you coming into the land of Canaan speaking Egyptian dialect, coming to a people that's already speaking Hebrew again. See that? So when you when you came back into the land, the descendants that came out, the descendants that came from those grown up in the land of Canaan is the ones who readopted the Hebrew or the Paleo Canaanite language again after coming out of Egypt, being accustomed to the Egyptian language. See that? Y'all ain't doing critical analysis and thinking when it comes to these these cultures and these languages y'all claiming as Hebrew. Hebrew is Paleo Canaanite language. It's a Hermetic language if you want to believe the text. It's not a Shemitic language. The Shemitic language was Cuneiform. That was the language of Abraham. That's what you're going to find in Ur of Chaldea, ancient Iraq. You're going to find Cuneiform writings. You're not going to find no Hebrew over there in antiquity. The oldest Hebrew manuscripts or the oldest Hebrew found is in the region of what we call Canaan or Israel, Palestine, that whole north Syria, that whole region over there. So just to let you know, you just can't be believing anything. You got to do, you got to use your logic and your common sense. If Abraham was born in Ur of Chaldea, what language did he speak? You got to ask yourself that question. When he came into the land of Canaan, what language was the Canaanite speaking? You got to ask those questions. Those are logical questions. Just like when the Christopher Columbus and them came over here, what language was he speaking? He was speaking Latin. What language was the people he encountered speaking? The Caribs and the Natives and the Arawaks and the Caribbeans, what language were they speaking? See that? These are the things you got to question yourself with, the, with antiquity. With the past. You got to question it the same way. If you're going to be claiming Hebrew is the holy language and all this extra stuff. They gave every book a chance, but when it comes to Owaspi, they prejudice, right? Where got to be drudges inspiring them, no doubt. Meaning intentionally ain't pure from jump because many desire leadership, which Owaspi, what does it say? Crushes, exactly. Exactly. They run from the Owaspi. But see, it's going to be hard because uh, there's going to come a point where everybody around them is going to start getting to the information. Because one thing with truth, you can't deny it. You could run from it, you could hide from it, but you can't deny it. And when that OSP speak that truth, they hear it. They resonate, but they deny it. Because they false God still got their mind believing of a 6,000-year-old doctrine. They, they mind stuck in the past. They don't know how to adapt to the times. Same thing with Yeshua. When Yeshua came, he was the face. He was the walking Owaspi of that time. He knew the mysteries. He was doing the miracles. He was telling cast the kingdom of God is at hand. The average person in Israel at that time wasn't talking like that. So he came with what we would consider today as a new revelation, which ain't nothing new. It's just that you it wasn't revealed to you. They said, I and the father are one. Who was talking like that? Well, he blasphemed me the father. He said he won with the father. You know what I mean? He flipping over table. He flipping over the temples in the market, whipping cats. He wilding. Yahshua was a renegade, yo. Even though Waspi said he was a severe preacher. So Yahshua wasn't no pussycat. He wasn't this Jesus y'all portraying him to be. This white man with stringy hair. Even if he was, he was a renegade. He flipping over. T Can you imagine seeing somebody going up in the church to right now on national TV, flipping over the church, taking a whip and start whipping the pastors and start whipping the chorus and all the people singing and just start going. We're going to look at him as a lunatic. We're going to look at him like, yo, son is bugging right now. He way out of order, not knowing this is the man coming from the creator. <laughs> this man is sent from the creator. Look how he moving. You see what I'm saying? So don't underestimate these things. Yahshua wasn't no puss around. He was making a statement to these Pharisees and Pharisees that y'all, y'all ain't right and exact. Y'all false. And I'm here to expose y'all. And that's dealing with them. 
And then he had the truth he had to preach to the people as far as the kingdom of God is at hand. The Pharisees wasn't given that information. They was against him, so they couldn't get that revelation. But the people that believed in him, they are the ones who got the mysteries of the kingdom of God is at hand. That's why he spoke in parables, demonstrating the kingdom of God through the parables, and they still couldn't understand. Even the disciples had to pull him to the side and ask him what was the meaning of some of the parables, because they couldn't grasp it. And the, parab the parables ain't nothing but he's explaining the kingdom of God using nature as some of the examples. He who sows seed and all that stuff, the tars and the wheat's going to be separated and this, then he's describing certain things that goes on in the kingdom. So you're not going to be burnt off in the kingdom. He says you know, he's going to divide the wheat from the shaft and they're going to bundle it up and burn them. You're not going to be burnt. You're going to be walled around with fire and contained. And then you're going to be redeemed, purged, purgatory from your sins and your evil ways. So that fire is not a hellfire. It's to retain you. It's like a jail. Just imagine you in a jail and the bars are fire. It's just there to contain you before you go see who? Before you go see the judge. The CEO going to come. Yo, it's your turn. You got to go see the judge. We're going to tell you what your charge is, how much time you made, and what you got to do. You know, your time before you, you get free. See what I'm saying? You locked up, but you, you got to do your, your, your servitude before you get free. A lot of times you do that servitude, you get out of jail. I won't do that time again. You straighten up. You had to go through hell to straighten up. But you couldn't avoid being in hell if you were to listen to your man when he told you, yo, don't go out there and sell them drugs, bro. I've been through that road already. You don't want to do that. You ain't want to listen. But you had to go through it and experience it in order to know. See that? These are examples of the heavenly kingdom. Just using that because we live in an earthly kingdom as above, so below. If there's jails on earth, there's jails in the heavens. If there's cities on earth, there's cities in the heavens. If there's vehicles on earth, there's vehicles in the heavens. When we go to heaven, niggas ain't going to be riding on camels and horseback crossing the desert. No. The spiritual world is more technological than the physical. When you read a wasp that describes them spaceships, them starships, I posted earlier the Star of Bethlehem was really a spaceship from the heavenly kingdom of God. And I showed you in, the, in, in Matthew how they recognize the star, they seen it rose, and the star, they followed the star to where the star stood over where the child was born. They said they seen the star rose. The star was in motion. And then it stood where the child was born. That's not your ordinary star. But the Bible didn't let you know that that was a chariot. It was the Oaspi had to come say, yo, this is what took place. A heavenly ship from the, the kingdom of paradise from true God came to see and bear witness to the birth of Yeshua. So look at that. You got extraterrestrial activity going on in your text. It said a ship. A U so just, 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 just put that in perspective. Just say you just chilling and you see a ship, a star, will look like a star, brilliant and bright, but too close. It's like, nah, yo, that's, that's way too close to be way out there as a star, but it's it's shining like a star, but it's like right there. It's even closer than the moon, using that as an example. But you don't know what it is. But you see what it is. You see it descend, you see it hovers, and then you see it ascend back up into the high heavens. Not knowing that those angels were sent to bear witness of a corporeal act of a child being born. And they reported it back to the heavens, to true God of paradise, and made the report. Then they sent guardian angels around Yeshua. And you remember when Yeshua said, I could send 20, 12,000 leagues of angels right now if I wanted? See, a wasp be showing you that, that where them angels coming from. When, when in the Bible, and it says that Yahshua went on the mountain to see Moses and Elias, a wasp be tells you why they came to him. This is why you got to get this information because certain things in the Bible is partially left. It's, it's things that it leaves you with more answers. So, so Moses died in the time of the Exodus, in the time of Joshua. What is he doing appearing to Yahshua 1,500 years later, 1,400 years later? Appearing to Yahshua. You ain't never questioned that. And then not only that, 
if he appeared to Yahshua, that means he was one of the first resurrection. He resurrected before the Messiah because he appeared to him after his death. You ain't question that? It states when Moses died in the Bible where he was buried. But then when you come to Matthews, it talks about how Moses appeared to Yahshua. Moses was an angel when he appeared to Yahshua. He was, an, an, his, he was in his angelic body when he appeared to Yeshua. And Elias appeared with him on the mountaintop. And a cloud covered the mountaintop. What do you think that cloud was? It was a chariot. And a voice came out the cloud saying, this is my son whom I'm beloved. Something like that. That's the angel speaking in the ship, referring to Moses. But they on top of the mountain in the cloud. The chariot parked on the cloud while it was with Moses and talking to Yeshua. Showing you extraterrestrial activity going on with Israel. This is why it's important for the Israelites to get this Bible and to really understand this. Because this is for you. You're supposed to be the part, you know, the, 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 the chosen nation, right? Hey, I represent the nation of Israel. But I don't represent the, the activities and, and the behavior that y'all have. The hate y'all have for the nations and all that. I don't represent that, but I do represent that we Israelites. And who's bringing you this information? An Israelite who claimed to be from the tribe of Judah. Just like in, the, in, in Revelation when they said they seen a book written upon it. That no man knew. No man could read it. No man could interpret it. But the seed of the root of David came and grabbed the book. You see what I'm saying? Cracked the seal. That's the Yawaspi. Because the Yawaspi is the revelation that nobody knew. Yaski, Israel scared to read it. Israel running from it. But it took an Israelite claiming from the tribe of Judah to crack the code and bring it to you. And now many Israelites realize that, damn, okay, this is the revelation from the Creator. It's in the name of Yahweh. It's not in the name of a foreign god. It's in the name of Yahweh, and Yahweh is coming proclaiming to be the creator in this book and exposing false gods who, who proclaim to be him in the in the past, showing you all that in the book. This is why we go hard. This is why we say you can put up chapter and verse with your Tanakh to show you, so we can show you your inconsistencies, so we can show you where you fall short, so we can show you where you, you right here, but you wrong here. And we're going to start off with your gods because your God has got you behaving the way you are. Your God is why you dress the way you are. Your customs and culture comes from your God. So we got to address the God. What it do? Facts, facts. So I just want to come drop some gems with y'all once again. You know what I mean? See a slow chiming in. I'm going to start doing this on, uh, on YouTube too. I'm going to go a couple times live on YouTube getting familiar with that because I'm going to start doing the YouTube lives. But check it out. You 